on your Jump, 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 jump. What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party Peace and love party people in the place to be is Talib Kweli, the BKMC, the MCEO. I got my homegirl in the house, Jasmine Lee, my good friend, the best co-host in the podcast game. Give it up for Jasmine Lee. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's up, Jasmine? I'm good. I joined the sweatshirt gang today. Oh, okay. Well, not everybody has sweatshirts, but you and me have on sweatshirts. Yeah. This is our gang. It's our gang. Okay, where's Bond? Um, today we're gonna have a great, great episode. Um, we're dealing with a legend today. Yes. And. The People's Party is proud to have brought you many, many, many legends, but we're entering new territory. This guy is a rock and roll legend. This guy is one of my favorite people on the planet. This guy is considered one of the best guitarists of all time. He makes every list. You can't make a list of the best guitarists ever without including this guy. He's a singer. He's a songwriter. Sometimes he's a rapper, a comic book author, a fierce activists, a member of the Industrial Workers of the World Union, a recipient of the Harry Chapman Humanitarian Award from Why Hunger, an organization that is dedicated to eliminating famine and poverty across the globe. As a musician, he's played guitar and Rage Against the Machine and Audio Slaves. Audio Slaves, excuse me. This is, these are major, major, major bands establishing himself as an architect of a very unique, innovative sound. Later, he was in Prophets of Rage with our friend of the show, Chuck D and our friend of the show, Be Real, and also got in Street Sweeper Social Club with our friend of the show, even though he hasn't come on the show yet, Boots Riley. Yes. And the Night Watchman Project. This man has projects for days. Born in Harlem, spent some time in Illinois, went to Harvard. He can make a guitar scream and shout. He can make one of the most dynamic guitar sounds I've ever heard on a record, me personally. Over the last few years, we have the Atlas Underground, Com Commandante. Now a new album, the Atlas Underground Fire with Eddie Vedder on it, Chris Stapleton on it, Damian Marley, the boss, Bruce Springsteen is on it. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for a stone cold rock and roll fucking God, a true revolutionary, so proud to have this man on the show and proud to call him a friend. Tom Morello is in the house. Thank you very much. That is, I appreciate that very flowery introduction. <laughs> I blush. I, you deserve all these flowers. Um, I'm mad at myself for calling Audio Slave Audio Slaves. No, it's, it's totally fine. It's a long list. There's a lot, there's a lot of projects. Yeah, I was here. trying to get you do too much music. Yeah, it's true. It's humble, it's humble brag. Yeah. It's a lot of projects. Yeah. <laughs> when I was um, even, you know, I pride myself on knowing as much as I possibly can in a short amount of time about my guest. And sure. even with all your projects, I had to ask you before we sat, as we sat down, like, wait, so when did this, and what's going on? Because <laughs> yeah. there's so much coming out. Yeah. And there's so much that's come out in the last. You're you're very prolific, brother. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, this was a crazy time. Like when, from the time I was 17 years old to March of 2020, I had, was nonstop touring, writing, and recording. All I came to a screeching halt when the world when the yeah. world shut down. Uh, you know, so from the first first four months, it was the first like real creative drought of my entire life. Mm -hmm. um, I have a studio at my home, a nice studio at my home, but I don't know how to work it. There's an mm -hmm. engineer who normally sits there yeah. and, and they, they only let me touch the volume knob and only <laughs> that rarely. You right. know what I'm saying? So, so there was no, like there was going to be no music and I found inspiration from a very unlikely source. That was Kanye West. Mm -hmm. I read an interview where Kanye was bragging about recording <laughs> vocals for a couple of his hit records on the voice memo of his phone. Yeah. Uh. So I just got out the voice memo on my phone and I started recording guitar riffs into it and they sounded fucking fantastic. So yeah. I just started sending them to producers and engineers around the world and started sort of forging this kind of rock and roll EDM hip hop pen pal club. Mm -hmm. And while I was alone in the bunker for a year, mm -hmm. I made probably more music than in any other year in my entire life. Right up. We use voice memos for this show. We do. During yeah. during the pandemic over yeah. the Zoom. Yeah. Um, I remember hanging out with you at Harvell's for the Outer National gig. Yes. Shout yes, out to yes, Miles yes. Soleil. You're born in Harlem. Yeah. Um, I don't want to mispronounce your father's name. Can you pronounce uh, it? Nyefe Jiroge. Nyefe, Nyefe Jiroge. Nyefe. Yeah. My uh, parents met in East Africa and Kenya. My mom yeah. was a My mom's like from a small, my mom, an Irish-Italian lady from a small coal mining town mm -hmm. in central Illinois, did something that no one from that town had ever done. She left. Mm -hmm. And as a single woman, traveled the world for about 20 years. Uh, she taught in Japan. She taught in Spain. She taught in, in Germany after World War II. She found herself in East Africa mm -hmm. teaching the Aberdeer Mountains during the Mau Mau mm -hmm. insurrection. And she was there... Like, like with a bunch of white teachers mm -hmm. teaching um, African students in school there, and she fell in with the people who were 
overthrowing British colonialism. Yeah, she met Mau my Mau's, man. Yeah, she met my gangster. Yeah, she met my, she met my <laughs> gangster. In case gangster. you don't know about the Mau Mau's, Google, do your Googles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and she met my dad, Nyethe Jiroge. He's his uncle was Jomo Kenyatta, who right. was, became you know became Kenya's president. first president, and and um, you know, but then. You know, she came. They they parted ways, and uh, she came back. And I was born. Uh, we lived at 146 in Riverside, you know, in Harlem for the first couple of years of my life. And your father was the first ambassador to the UN from Kenya. That's right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is a hell of a yeah. upbringing yeah. that right. you have. Your he was mother... all. He was also in charge of land redistribution in Kenya. Wow. And he, so he used had to, a lot he, of power. He said. He said. Well, I mean, how satisfying must that be? He said. He said when the British came, we had the land, and they had the Bibles. Mm-hmm. And then after about 10 years, they had the land and we had the Bible. That's right. And now we have the land again. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, your mother was also a civil rights or is a civil yeah. rights activist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, the anti Tipper Gore. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she God ran, bless her for yeah, that. Yeah. She ran an organization <laughs> called Parents uh, for Rock and Rap. Yeah, man. I'm yes. with it. Yeah. Yeah. Which was against the, I mean, I don't know if, how the age of listeners here, but yeah. the PMRC was this kind of Washington wives organization that was trying to mm-hmm. dampen down heavy metal and hip hop. Mm-hmm. And so my mom, who looks exactly like the l- the little white retired high school teacher <laughs> Midwest that she is, <laughs> she was on the, you know, she would be on CNN with, with Luke and with, and with right. Ice-T and with, right. you know. <laughs> Those were the paragons of free speech at that That's time. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Standing up for uh, free speech. Um, your mother is also an advocate for Mumia Abu Jamal. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. as are you, and yeah. as are the bands that you've sure, worked with. Sure, sure. Um, I went to visit Mumia. Mm, yeah. It's one of the most powerful experiences I've yeah. ever had. Um, you and I, we had to have met. We've talked about it a couple times. We met. We had to have met at the Beastie Boys concert at the Meadowlands in 1999. Yes, yeah. It was yeah. Beastie Boys, Rage Against the Machine, and Black Star. That's right. And Kurt Loder asked me what I would say to a dead cop's wife, and I said. And I didn't have the answer at that time, but that became one of my most popular lyrics. I have a song on my uh, album, Quality, my first solo album, mm. called The Proud, about uh, 9-11 and Mumia and all these things. And, mm. and I said, Kurt Loder asked me what I would say to a dead cop's wife. And I said, cops kill my people every day, that's life. And it's like, you know, I put Kurt Loder in my music because, you know, I'm from the MTV generation. Sure, I grew sure, up sure. on this guy. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, just yeah. be interviewed with him yeah. by him was like amazing. I was like, mama, I made it. But um, yeah, shout out to your mom for being an advocate for Mumia. Um, she taught at Libertyville High School in Illinois, which you went to. That's right. And you formed a band with Adam Jones. That's right. From Not school. in high school though, right? We were in the band in high school. Electric Sheep? The Electric Sheep. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my mom taught, this was a high school. I literally integrated the town of Libertyville, <laughs> Illinois, for, for, according to the real estate agent. Right. Like I was okay. the first person of college who reside within the borders there. And my mom taught five African studies courses mm. at this, at this, you know, uh, homogenous high, high school. school. Yeah, pretty crazy. That's brilliant, man. Yeah, yeah. It changed a lot of people's, a lot of people's lives. Yeah, you know, just like giving them different perspective. You went to Harvard mm. and received. I like saying it like that. Is that how you say it? <laughs> My brother went to Harvard. I always say it like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying to him like Whoever, that. Whoever, uh, whenever I say it, I'm like Harvard. <laughs> uh, and you received a bachelor's in social studies. What was your experience like in Harvard? Uh, at Harvard? <laughs> yeah. Especially being a biracial black man, and in what ways did race affect you? while you were there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the reason why I wanted to go to Harvard was because they had like the biggest endowment of any university. So they accept their freshman class need blind, meaning they put together, they they recognize that most of your education happens outside of the classroom. So it's the people you're with, it's your roommates, it's what's happened, what's happens in the cafeteria. So they want the most diverse group of people. There are kids from like maybe 40, 50 different countries in my class, mm-hmm. you know? And, and so they basically, I, you know, at the time, I think my family had to come up with, 1500 or three grand a year because we didn't have any money and and that's that was like really appealing to me like it wasn't just Harvard sort of has this this like there's a vibe like there's a bunch of rich kids there no there was like farmers and there you know coal miner kids and, and whatnot there and you really were able to learn from each other so for me like I went there to 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 to, to sharpen my revolutionary mind to try to just overthrow shit but a crazy <laughs> thing happened along the way was I got had the calling to be an electric guitarist. Mm. When I was 19 years old, as a freshman, it happened, you know, somewhere between the foosball machine and the laundry machine down in the freshman, you know, in the freshman union was like the skies parted and I didn't have a choice anymore. Mm. So both blessed and cursed with being a black guitar, you know, heavy metal spandex jerry curl, you know, guitar player at an Ivy League university studying political science. People were like, like that's a weird ass unicorn. Mm. Right. <laughs> yeah, man. I figured, I didn't know you went to Harvard until I started reading more about you. And I'm like, this guy's just a genius with the guitar. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, Take the Power Back um, is such an important record. Um, it's one of the prettiest guitar 
pieces of music I heard on a guitar mm -hmm. ever. Um, uh, Wake Up, such a great song. And that connected me to Rage in a way, uh, lyrically, with they murdered X to try to blame it on Islam. That lyric, I'm like, okay, who are these rock and roll guys saying this? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a, I related to those lyrics. Um, a, a lot of the Rage music ends up in the Matrix movies. Sure, sure. Matrix, sure. And Matrix Reloaded. Yeah. Um, the Wachowskis, they kind of do movies that thematically are like rage songs, Absolutely. right? Like Cloud Atlas. Yeah, and, yeah. And um, yeah. unapologetically, uh, uh, they do. V for yeah. Vendetta. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there rage music in the New Matrix? <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be for me to say, right? Okay, now. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> I think that the, I think the themes of Matrix movies and the themes of Rage Against the Machine music, uh, there's still a bridge between those two. That's so right, and it we'll still hit. works. Um, Wait I for think the I heard you say that rage music. Does it ever feel nostalgic? No, it never does. No, I mean it's it, always it, relevant. It's all. I mean, you, mm. we, you, I, and that's not. I'm not making that up. You know, when yeah. there's when there's street battles from Santiago to Portland, mm -hmm. you know, those jams are cranked. I think it's yeah. just it's you know it speaks to the testament of those four guys. You know, of, mm -hmm. of Zach, Tim, Brad, and, and myself, and and how you know we created something that was that none of us could have done on our own. You know, mm -hmm. from Zach's brilliant lyrics to the you know the incredible uh, rhythm section of Tim and Brad to mm -hmm. my contributions on the guitar and like the whole vibe, like like. Each of us was in a different place before we met. And then, honestly, from the first rehearsal in, in August of 1991, it sounded like that. Wow. Like, it was just, there wasn't a lot. It was like when these guys play together, it's Rage Against the Machine, you know, from right. that day to this. It's beautiful. Mm. Killing in the Name of is one of the best rock songs ever and definitely one of the best protest songs. And you guys say fuck 17 times, <laughs> which actually comes to define the band. Can you take us through creating that song? Sure. I think it's actually 16 fucks and one motherfucker. Just to clarify. Just to clarify for the record. Just to fact check us. Fact check us. <laughs> for, the, for, for the record. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, I, first, for, I'll, I'll talk about some of the nuts and bolts of, of that song. But for me, I think that the, the the timeless quality of that song has to do with the you know with Zach's brilliant lyric and and to me it 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 relates to something in the Frederick Douglass autobiography mm -hmm. where Frederick Douglass said he was freed from slavery not the moment when he was released from his physical bonds mm -hmm. it was when Master said yes and he said no. Mm. Wow. And that's fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. It's that's like right. it's a, it's standing up against illegitimate authority wherever yes. it rears its ugly head, in your home, in your community, in your place of work, in your school, in your country at large. The actual nuts and bolts of the song were, I mean, it's funny because that was that song, I think we kind of buried that on our demo. It was song six on our demo. Mm. You know what I mean? So we it was not obvious to us from the from the from the get-go. Yeah, but I was a guitar teacher in Hollywood making making ends meet, and I was teaching some local rocker how to do drop D tuning. I will not bore you with what that is, but anyway, it's just sort of it's a way that the guitar sort of sounds a little bit different. And in just in showing him how it kind of reconfigured the fretboard, I came up with that riff: boom, do da chicka da na 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 ba na da. And I said, hold on one second. Got out my little Radio Shack, you know, cassette recorder, mm -hmm. put it down there for rehearsal Radio the next day. Radio Shack? Is that still alive? <laughs> <laughs> this was a long time ago. It was in 1990. It was in 1991. I remember this Radio Shack. <laughs> <laughs> Without Radio Shack, that song, we would not be talking about that song right, right now. Radio Shack was very important to my upbringing as a, as a musician. Absolutely. Just, they had Absolutely. all the gadgets. Yeah, they had all the gadgets yeah. for, for nothing, for cheap. Yeah. So anyway, so brought that into rehearsal, and then, you know, it became a part of, like, our set. And it was actually, curiously, and... And incredibly, it was the suggestion of our A and R person at the record company to make that song with sixteen fuck yous and one motherfucker the first single. Mm. I couldn't believe it. It was when music was sort of changing. It was Ford from thinking engine A and R. Absolutely, right, yeah. absolutely. It was like it went from this world of these kind of like pop rock heavy metal bands of the eighties to the Nirvanas, the Pearl Jams, Tool bands like that. Where I think the record companies recognized we don't necessarily understand everything that's going on, but we want it to be the most of what it is that right. it can't it turn that up. And that song felt like it was sort of the epitome of what we could do. Right. I was just on a business call in the back and we were watching the video for this and it's like, they were trying to get me to do something. And I was like, well, no, did the money come in? I'm like, well, no. And then and in, in, the, in, the, in the back, it's like, do what they told you. <laughs> do what they told you. And then I was like, well, no, I'm not going to do it. And it was like, fuck you. I want. Yeah. And Jasmine's like, yo, this song is perfect it for applies, everything. It applies in right. a lot of situations. Right. Yeah, just keep that one in your back pocket. <laughs> Bulls on Parade in this record, you do something with the guitar that sounds like a DJ. Yeah. And... You've credited Jam Master J, rest in peace, for yes. the influence yeah, with this. Yeah. Um, it's like listening to a Rick Rubin production live, right. who's somebody you've called the fifth Beatle to audio slave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not audio slaves, but audio yeah. slaves. <laughs> um, 
you've had to let fans know on Audio Slave and Rage albums that it's just guitars, bass, and drums, and not samplers That's and right. DJ equipment. Because right. people are like, how is he doing this? I've heard you refer to as the DJ of Rage Against the Machine. Yeah. yeah. So you know, dive into some of that. Sure, sure. Us. That's when I started. I think there's when you pick up an instrument, there's sort of two lanes that you can be in. One, there's musicians, mm -hmm. and then there are artists, mm -hmm. and they sometimes mm -hmm. overlap and they sometimes do not. And for the first ten years of playing electric guitar, I was a, I became a very technically talented musician. Mm -hmm. I did not have my own voice on the instrument, however. Mm -hmm. I was not able to write music that I loved. I could play a shredding guitar solo or make you weep with you know, right. with 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 emotion with it, but I wasn't didn't. And it was really at the beginning of Rage where I started self-identifying as the DJ in the band and yeah. rather practice I was practicing eight hours a day at the time and rather practice an Eddie Van Halen scales, I started practicing Jam Muster Jake cuts and mm. and the uh, police helicopters and trip to the zoo and whatnot. And all of a sudden, like the blinders came off and I just was like, I this doesn't sound like other guitar players. Mm -hmm. And at the time, there was a lot of people were like, the, the electric guitar is done. People can now sample. You don't need a guitar player. Mm -hmm. You can sample. There's, guitars have been played already. <laughs> we'll sample the ones that have been played. We don't right. need you anymore. And I was like, oh, right. let's see who gets outdated. I'm going to do with my bare hands what DJs do. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to scritchy scratch on that. And I, you know, and I would love. I would <laughs> scritchy scratch. Scritchy scratch. <laughs> and, and many and many a show like with DJ Lord or whoever. Like we will just right. go Shout head to head. DJ we will head. Such an incredible DJ. Yeah, incredible. Ooh. incredible yeah. I yeah. encourage people to look up on YouTube. DJ Lord and Prophets of Rage shows and just D public enemy shows. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's incredible. He's incredible. Yeah. But anyway, but so so I I used to be sort of a competitive gunslinger in the world of guitar players, and I became a competitive gunslinger in the world of like scritchy scratch. Scritchy <laughs> scratch. I'm gonna go home and scritchy scratch on my electric guitar. <laughs> From Run DMC to Public Enemy, you obviously are very heavily influenced by hip hop. What were you guys listening to in the beginning of Rage? Yeah, it was it was that first Cypress Hill record was big. That yeah, that they had, did that Killer had, Man. Yeah, that had just dropped, and it was we had that, and we had like the Soundgarden record was out then too. But we listened to like Ice Cube was mm -hmm. big. Uh, mm -hmm. Ice Cube was huge on the turntable. Of course, the entire Public Enemy catalog, mm -hmm. and I listened like that. Um, the, the production on those records, I also tried. Yeah, the Bomb Squad production. I yeah. tried to kind of get into that and try to f try to make textural rhythms with the guitar, like they did on those records. So, I mean, I think I, you know there was a bit of a Nirvana influence there too. But really, it was Cube, PE, Cypress Hill from the hip hop end of the spectrum that uh, you know were lighting our fire. And I, did I hear that when Zach had first left the band, was Be Real considered a lead singer that, or something? That, I mean, we were. A, we were taking our time to figure out what we were doing, and then really once we once we started listening to those Soundgarden records and Chris Cornell, it was pretty clear that that was the direction yeah. we wanted to go. But you did work with Be Real on Profits. Yes, yeah, Be Real and Chuck D and Profits of Rage, and two of my favorite MCs, two of my favorite people, like really mm -hmm. just like lovely souls, as well as being tremendously talented. Those shows were just incredible that you guys were doing. What made the band disband? Uh, well, we 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 booked a Rage Against the Machine tour. Okay, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. We're like, yeah, yeah like, like uh, we and you know, then the world shut down. But yeah, yeah. we uh, had a really great time with the, with with Prophets of Rage, and I loved the sort of like the love and mutual respect with those mm -hmm. dudes, and you know, with two of my heroes, like yeah. two of my heroes. Like it's such it's so trippy. Like in my life, I've gotten to play with Zach De La Rocha and Chris Cornell and Chuck D and Be Real and Bruce Springsteen. You know, I'm like yeah. like like yeah. some of the like the like what the, fuck? the Mount Rushmore of like awesome frontman yeah. and lyricists. These are the people that shaped you. It's like, absolutely. I, absolutely. My life is like that too. My count my friends and my collaborators musically as the people who lined my walls when oh. I was a kid. It's mm. like like when I look back to my walls and for me, it was all hip hop. It was yeah. like Rap Masters, Word Up, Write On Magazine, sure. shit like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's like all these posters on my walls, I have all these guys' numbers in my phone and I could reach out to right, them. Right, right. It's them. just crazy. Yeah, it's, it's like crazy. Manifest Destiny, Word it's Up. Crazy. Mm -hmm. um, in 97, the Rage Against the Machine Wu-Tang Clan tour rolled out. Whoa, have you seen this Wu-Tang documentary on Showtime? I haven't seen it. I haven't seen so it. So you talk about this tour. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't remember who it is. I think it's Raekwon, <laughs> but I could be wrong. But they talk about how and why they left the tour. Yeah. And how there was some expression of regret in the documentary. Mm -hmm. Like, we didn't have our shit together. We, you know, we didn't understand the impact of Wu-Tang and Rage. Yeah. And we left that tour. And had we stayed on that tour... Things might have been different. Do you feel the same? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, we were just, I felt blessed and honored to have 
to be on tour with Wu Tang. Like Wu Tang Clan, Rage Against the Machine, nineteen ninety seven. Like it was the craziest like idea. Yeah. But I think that their their experience they hadn't really toured before. Mm -hmm. They'd played shows and they had done mm -hmm. like award shows, and, but like touring is a grind. Mm -hmm. You know, and you've got to be in Jacksonville, Florida, and then the next night you got to be in Miami, and you got to and people kept wanting to you know go home. They had other responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I think don't think it's they nine really, guys. Yeah, it's nine trying guys. Trying to do nine different they things. Never, I don't think they went through that phase of like, hey, we're a band in a van. You yeah. know. <laughs> Like, like for yeah. 10 years, like they didn't do that. They were just like, we're Wu-Tang Clan. And, um, you know, and so I got to say, I, I had a great time. And, and RZA, like RZA and I remain close to this day. I, right. I love him. And, uh, and I think that he really got it back then. But I, it was if they were on half the tour, I'll take that. It was All fantastic. Right. But I do have to tell you, there's a, a, a di great dirty story. So so OD, ODB, or I'm not sure what name. It might have been. Big Baby Jesus. Or Dwight D. Eisenhower. Right. Remember that face? Oh, Osiris. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. not sure what. <laughs> so he was. <laughs> I think we played, we had 34 shows booked with okay. Wu-Tang Clan. They played 17 of them. I don't think they ever crossed the Mississippi. I don't okay. think they crossed the Mississippi. They played 17 of them. Dirty was at two. Okay. Oh, <laughs> and one was the New York show and one was the Atlanta show. So um, I'm getting ready, you know, Wu-Tang played first and I'm getting ready for the show and I'm kind of wandering around the tour buses in the parking lot okay. and Wu-Tang Clan is on stage uh -huh. destroying the crowd. And who do I see wandering around the parking lot? But old dirty bastard, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, I don't think he ever learned my name. Like, right, right, right. <laughs> Bless his heart. But I'm like, hey, how's it going? He's like, bro. Like, I'm like, yeah. And he's, he's like, what's your name? I'm like, I'm Tom. Hi. Nice to meet you. He's like, where's the stage? And I'm like, I, I can't. It's hard to describe. Like, this is a, it's a, it's a shed. So there's this, there's one thing. There's right. a parking lot and, and the a stage. stage. <laughs> There's one thing, and it's big, and there's Wu-Tang Clan music coming from it. <laughs> right? There's Wu-Tang Clan music coming from it. And I'm like, it's right, like right there. Right, He's right. like, thanks, bro. And he continues walking the other direction. Whoa. Just the end of the night. And didn't do the show. I don't know. That's, I'm, not, I'm not his keeper. I'm that's not a great old dirty bastard. <laughs> that's one of the great. That's one of the great ones. You've had a blessed life, bro. You've had a blessed life. Um, the roots replaced Wu. Wu yes, right? yeah, the Wu Tang. Did you get close with them at that time? Yeah, 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 yeah. They were great. I mean, they, I, one thing I love, like Questlove, I remember watching him on that tour. Like, there's there are musicians, and then there are musicians, musicians. Mm -hmm. And dude just had his his shit so together. He would be, I think this was like BlackBerry era. Yeah, like BlackBerry era. He'd be rocking the show while like Black Test. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, just taking care of whatever it was he needed to take I'd care of. I get texts from Questlove while on stage about what we going to do. Exactly. Oh my yeah. God. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Um. Let's talk about one of my favorite shows of all time, Saturday Night Live. Okay. Right now, I grew up watching this show. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're hitting, you, the, you're hitting the highlights, bro. You're hitting the highlights. Saturday Night Live is one of my favorite shows, sure, yeah. and I grew up watching me and my father. It's like a whole, it's like a whole fatherly experience sure, I have yeah. with this show. I read all the books. You know, I'm really a fan, but I think it's a high prestige to be in the club of people who are banned from that show. <laughs> because think about it. It's you, it's Cypress Hill, it's Sinead O'Connor, it's Martin Lawrence, right? It's like it's, I don't think what? any what? of them got thrown out the got building thrown out during the, the show, show. Right? Yeah, I, Fresh <laughs> Prince style. I think they maybe got a memo afterwards. Right. I was on the sidewalk in front of NBC <laughs> while, while Steve the, Forbes, well, while Steve Forbes was, was, saying, was saying good night, was, saying, was trying to do a skit. Yeah, tell us about that. Tell us about your opposition to Steve. Oh Forbes my gosh! Well, this is. I mean, well, was. okay. So, so this was uh, around. It was the week of release of the Rage Against the Machine record, Evil Empire. Mm -hmm. We hadn't made a record in four years. It was highly anticipated. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Forbes, who was a, it was a billionaire Republican presidential candidate, had mm -hmm. just finished his run. So he was mm -hmm. like the. Whole, here's the ironic ju juxtaposition. It's Steve Forbes, Republican. Billionaire rage against the machine. It feels like a setup. It feels. <laughs> I'm just saying. And sure enough, it's it like a sitcom plot. Yeah. So 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 at um so at sound check on the th you do the run a show on Thursday. Mm -hmm. At the time, our stage setup had upside down American flags on the amplifiers, which is mm -hmm. sort of like the Navy signal for distress, right? Mm -hmm. So and they're like, ah, you can't do that because Steve Forbes and because of advertisers and this that and the Dr. other. Evil. Yeah. And mm. and so you know and like this is a this is a band whose most popular song says fuck. You, I won't do what <laughs> you, you tell, tell me. me. Okay, so 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 they're like, so they're like we need you, you to guys, take. You guys kind of set yourself. We up need you. We need you to take those down. <laughs> right. And we're like, okay, right. okay. So comes the night of the show, and it, it, Saturday Night Live is a live show. I can confirm that. And <laughs> one minute till airtime, our roadies put the flags back up. The right. stage, and there's a live crowd. And the stage, like, take those. 
Fudge don't know. <laughs> and then we're just like, Wait, ready. was it Don Pardo voice? No, no, it was like, the guy, <laughs> let me, this guy was not Don Pardo. This was like Don, like the Sopranos Don okay, Pardo okay, guy. Okay, He's okay. like, and so their, their crew guys go to take, and we've informed our crew guys, defend the flags. Defend the defend flags. Defend the flags. And so their crew guys come up, and our guys sort of, you know, move in front of them, and there's like a Scrum on stage. We're at forty five. We're at forty five seconds. We're yeah. at forty five seconds. You know, now their guys are moving to take them. Our guys who do uh, honestly kind of let us down a little bit. Right. Nobody didn't really scrap like I had hoped they would. Right. <laughs> they so we're at thirty seconds, and Did now they're getting extra, access to the flags. You got to fight for the flags. You got to offer them extra they're money. They're getting for access the to the flags. We're at fifteen right. seconds. They're tugging the flag. Pull them down. The flags are removed from the stage. The partisan. Right wing audience of Steve Forbes is now applauding that we are not having upside down flags. Please, Steve Forbes says, please welcome Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> That's it. If you ever see the video yeah. of that, that we're, it were five seconds from yeah. there being a fight on stage. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, before we play the song. And after the song, we're in the dressing room sort of contemplating like what just happened there. We still have one more song, one more song to play. And now my man Timmy does not take issue. It, my man, T- Timmy takes issue with what just happened mm-hmm. there. So he's backstage and he tears up one of those flags and he knots it up into a ball, like a, a ball that could be, perhaps be used as a weapon. Mm-hmm. And he marches across the hallway into Steve Forbes' dressing room, presumably to attack him with mm-hmm. the curled up. With the Steve Forbes has secret service dudes because he mm-hmm. was just a presidential candidate. Mm-hmm. So Steve Forbes isn't in there. Timmy sort of chucks it in there. I don't know, at the mirror, at his family. I'm not sure what happened. The backstage <laughs> floods with secret service people. Uh-huh. We're now like kind of, closeted off in the dressing room. And after a while, the NBC dude comes like, hey, so like we're running a little late today with the show. We've, we're not going to have time for your second song. So if you guys could just come with me, please. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm standing on the sidewalk outside of the NBC like, we just flew 3,000 miles to play one song. And wow. It all worked out. The song went to, no, I mean, the record went to number one anyway that week. Beautiful. So. And you had a badass story out of it. Well, yeah, I'm, the story can be told. <laughs> right. And the Testify video, it shows how all presidents are the same. Uh, let's discuss for a minute Biden's reaction to the Haiti crisis. Because I know rage has always been for immigrant rights. Do you feel let down by Biden's current response to the? I mean, you can only be let down if you have expectations of some of the right thing happening. Mm-hmm. I was the I worked as the scheduling secretary for United States Senator Alan Cranston for two years, a progressive Democratic senator, and I got to see how the sausage was made, and it's much worse than you could possibly ever imagine. Mm-hmm. I have no. It doesn't surprise me in the least. There's a. There is a there is a political oligarchy that absolutely pulls the strings with money, and that is the o- those are the only people that those guys are beholden to. The only people they're not like I mean, you know who doesn't have lobbyists? Homeless people. You know who doesn't have lobbyists? Haitian immigrants. Mm-hmm. Like they they respond one hundred percent to that money. My job when I worked for Senator Kranz, I, I scheduled his every minute of his day, so I saw every minute of the day, and most of those waking minutes were were me getting a rich dude on the phone for him to ask that dude for money. That's the whole job. And then that money doesn't, none of that money comes for free. And you know who's not, who I'm not calling up? I'm not calling up Haitian immigrants to ask them what they need from the center. So so none of that comes as the least bit surprising. You know, and, and yeah, it is, it is, you know, just sort of one more example of what I believe is the cornerstone underlying DNA of this nation, which is demand liberty while embracing white supremacy. Mm. That's right. And you said that you got fired or had to leave that job because you dealt with a racist on the phone. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So so one day one day this lady calls up and I was I was the the secretary was out who takes phone calls from the mm-hmm. public. So I was I was helping her, I was taking calls. And this woman calls up and she is pissed. And you know why she's pissed? There are Mexicans moving into her neighborhood. <laughs> she wants a senator to do something about that. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, I'm like what exactly do you right. think he's going to do? Like go home door to door and throw him out? So I say, ma'am, you're a damn racist and you can go to hell. And I think I have served the senator well on this day. Yeah, and you were very nice about it. I was. I have served the senator well. Like we have let a racist know. And mm-hmm. I got yelled at for two weeks by every <laughs> everybody. Just cuss, not, not cuss, right. but like, like you can't. It's a constituent. And like if I'm in a job where I can't tell a damn racist to go to hell, then I'm in the wrong job, right. which is what I discovered. And in the intervening 30 years, I've been telling racists to go to hell in my job. So I feel like I made the right choice. Yeah, man. I have racist trolls come at me all the time on social media. And out of somebody who I knew who's support, you know, somebody who graciously was supporting a show I'm doing, doing like these DJ sets in Austin every last Tuesday, right? Somebody who's graciously supporting it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, racist trolls, they don't just go after me. They go after people who support me. Sure. Particularly if they're women, they go after them even harder. 
Um, and so they were just trolling this young lady and just trolling her, trolling her to the point where she took the post down. And she called me about it, very distressed. Mm. It's like, I just don't feel safe online and thing sure, I'm going I through. And, and you, you're famous, so you're used to it and <laughs> yeah, happens yeah, to you yeah, all the yeah, time. Yeah, I'm just not used to this level of trolling. Yeah. And I got a little frustrated with her because I was just, you know, I was like, I felt like clearly what these people are saying about me are lies. And if the, the, if they're bullying you into publicly distancing yourself from mm. me, then the liars are winning. Mm -hmm. right. But then I went and saw what they were writing, and I was just like, man, I was like, wow. You know, it, they, was, they were writing very, very, very um, hateful things. But it's to your point, that's where my disappointment came. And I'm not her. Yeah, yeah. I'm never, somebody who's never been through that versus me who's used to it. Yep, yep, yep. But you make those decisions early as an artist. What am I willing to stand next to? And mm -hmm. what am I willing to sacrifice for yeah, it? And yeah. it's not, those decisions are not as easy for everybody. Yeah, else, yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, for me, like my, my principal influences, you know, as a young guitar player were the Black Panthers and Che Guevara mm -hmm. and the Weathermen. Yeah. And Rosa Luxemburg. And Kwame and Krumah. Yes. Those are my influences as guitar players. So yes. it was always really clear to me, like that that's you know, that's my camp right there. And come what may, like I could give a shit. Right. Like I'm not making music for you. And you run a business, but you run a business based on those principles. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um the video, this video changed my life when I saw it. Uh Sleep Now in the Fire. <laughs> um, you know, I was I was marginally a fan of Rage at the time. Um, you know, I was more into hip-hop. Yeah. And it, I hadn't really understood what Rage really, really represented. Mm -hmm. um, when I saw that video, I was a fan of Michael Moore. Yeah. So when I saw that video, I was like, wow, okay. You perform in front of the Wall Street Stock Exchange illegally. Use art to shut down American capitalism, at least for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Michael Moore was arrested, but the video itself was revolutionary. Could you walk us through? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I was a fan of Mike's work and, and never met him before. I had one question I couldn't wait to ask him uh, when he came into the trailer. How many times have you been arrested? Wow. Okay, yeah. And he's like, I've never been arrested. And I jokingly said, well, you never worked with Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> right. jinxed him. Yeah, I might, I might have jinxed him. So, so we're making the video, and we have a permit to film on the federal steps. It's, mm. That's where George Washington took his oath of office mm. on those steps, and mm. it's in the, the statues there. Kitty corner from the New York Stock Exchange. So we're playing there, and Mike is a, a director of very few words. And the directorial edict that he gives us is, no matter what happens— don't stop no playing. matter what happens, don't stop playing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you're making a video, just for those listeners who maybe like, you're not really playing the song. There's like playback coming through a CD player at the mm -hmm. time, and you're miming along to the song. So we're on the steps, and we go through it a bunch of times, and it's going great. And then he says, "Now we're going to go down to the city sidewalk where we do not have a permit to play." Okay. And so we go down there. We're playing "Sleep Now in the Fire," and a New York City police officer comes up to me and says, "Hey, you don't have a permit. You got to get back on the steps." And now mm -hmm. I remember what Mike said. He said, no matter what happens, this clearly falls under the category of something happening. Mm -hmm. right. Don't stop playing. Right. So we continue to play. Bah, nah, 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 nah. And the cops get He's like, get back up on the steps. You hear me? Mm -hmm. bah, nah, 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 nah. And now, if you've ever had any altercations with the law, there's a thing I call the cop vein. It's a vein in the neck of a cop. <laughs> and, that neck, and, that, and, that, and that vein begins. I recognize that vein because I get rapper veins. <laughs> oh my when God. I that vein lot. begins to pulse. <laughs> right. We've when, only seen it once. The vein begins to pulse. <laughs> and his vein is pulsing. He's like, get back on the fucking steps right now. And like, bam, nah, 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 nah. And he reaches down and he unplugs my guitar. But the guitar does not, not stop. stop playing. <laughs> Because it's coming through the CD. Mm -hmm. And he steps back with like a look of religious he's like, horror. Like, <laughs> he's, like, he's like, what the fuck? And he, uh, and he unplugs Timmy's bass and he takes the drums and he takes the microphone. Like the band is- Because you're like, doing a music video. Make it. We don't have any instruments. And yet it's like, bam, bam, bam. And he's like, and the look out, it's, like, it's like science doesn't add up. He's like, he's like this is a coven of warlocks. Oh like what gosh. is that? So he does the only thing that he could possibly do in that circumstance. Arrest Michael Moore, the director. So he puts Mike in handcuffs and is dragging him away. And then Mike gives his second directorial edict of the afternoon, which is take the New York Stock Exchange, yeah. which was not in the video treatment. Right. So we put down our instruments and we I walk through the door of the New York Stock Exchange. There's some guy in a frumpy jacket, you know, like the security guy. I'm like, I'm here to take the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> is that a left, is that a left or a right? 
<laughs> and so he hits the red button, and like the riot doors come down, like the, like the riot doors come down, and like the real guys come, and they you see it's all in the video. They push us out the door of the thing, but for for a brief while on a Tuesday afternoon, Michael Moore and Rage Against the Machine made capitalism come to a halt. Yes, That's right. history. That's right. Word is bond. That's beautiful, man. Um, yeah, word up. <laughs> word up. Um. You were very supportive of Occupy Wall Street, mm -hmm. as was I. Um, and Rage and yourself and everything you've done have always taken a very anti-capitalist stance. Um, and you, in high school, if I'm correct, went from anarchist to socialist. Yeah, I'm just, I like to swim in all those waters. Okay, you know I what I mean? It, like, I it's a it. big tent. I get it. It's yeah, a big yeah, tent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, right now, especially in the Trump era, we've seen capital, uh, communism and socialism demonized by the right, giving us the whole... Nazis are the real socialists. Yeah. Misdirect. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what's your view on that? Yeah. I mean, the one thing that I think is very encouraging is like, you know, young people, 17 to 30 or whatever, mm -hmm. have a much more positive view of socialism than they do of capitalism. So like mm -hmm. that's like, and I think that that has to do in large measure to the seeds planted by the Occupy Wall Street movement. Yeah, that's absolutely. when, that's when the dirty five letter word class was mm -hmm. put on the front page of the New York Times. You know what I'm saying? So, so yeah. um, the way I look at it, it's like, you can take away, you can take away the isms. It's all like... I come from Trump country. You know, mm -hmm. after Harlem, I lived in central Illinois. It's a coal mining community. These are people that have been fucked over by Republican administrations and Democratic administrations. And the, and the, the, the fact that like, those people are all beholden to that same oligarchy, it just, they just feel abandoned. And it's ripe ground for a grift, mm -hmm. for a grifter, for a, yeah. demo, for a demagogue who uses the oldest trick in the book. The problem's not this neoliberal capitalist system. The problem is Muslims. Yeah. The problem is immigrants, mm -hmm. you know, and it's and it's it's an easy solution to a much more complicated problem, mm -hmm. and that's why the this Atlas Underground Fire record is the twenty first studio record of my career, and the one thread that runs through all twenty one of those records is the simple fact that the world is not going to change itself. That's up to you, and by you. I mean literally you, whoever's hearing this right now. Mm -hmm. Whenever the world has changed in progressive, radical, or even revolutionary ways, it has been ch that change has not come from above. It's come from people who are no different than anyone listening. The people who ch the people who made the Berlin Wall fall, who ended apartheid, who uh, participated in the civil rights movement, had no more power, creativity, influence, intelligence, anything than anyone listening right now. It's a matter mm -hmm. of getting up and standing up for a more just and decent and humane world in your time. Right. Word. Well, cheers to that. Cheers. <laughs> yes, indeed. That. <laughs> okay, how do you feel about racists and Republicans that have massive love for Rage Against the Machine due to the heavy metal aspect? And do you have any desire to weed them out, or would you rather rock as in the Trojan horse to deliver them your message? Yeah, well, I mean— it the short answer is fuck those fuckers. But but the, the, <laughs> but the, but the long but the longer view is that that great music casts a wide net. You know, like the music of Rage Against the Machine, the music of you know, like the solo music that I've tried to be in, involved in, mm -hmm. is you. If you're compelling musically, people get down are down with the music, and then they're forced to confront the underlying message. Mm -hmm. Some of them ignore it. Some of them embrace it. Some of them misunderstand it. But we are not, like, I've never been into like, here's a, like take a Noam Chomsky lecture and put a beat to it. Nobody mm -hmm. wants that. Right. You got to kick people's asses and make great guitar. And I don't mind, like, when they, when they try to own something that me and my friends have created as part of their racist agenda, of course, it's ridiculous. I think they just look like fools. I think mm -hmm. they honestly look like fools. But it does speak to the fact that that music does not have an ideological litmus test for enjoying it. And mm. that means that many people who have never heard those ideas are forced to confront those ideas yeah. because of the power of the rock and roll. That's what I think. I love it. I love it. Right. Um, now, at some point, Zach left Rage Against the Machine, and you guys were having a lot of arguments, and I've heard you say you guys were arguing over like things as small as the color of T-shirts and things like this. Um, you guys got back together and, you know, patched your friendship back up. What was that like? Well, when when Rage reunited for Coachella in 2007, that was one of the favorite days of my life, you know, mm -hmm. just to be reunited with my brothers and to, and to you know, to share the, the, the 
precious and unique thing that only the four of us can create again was pretty mm -hmm. awesome, you know. And we toured the we toured the planet and got along great and played a lot of ping pong backstage and rock fool senseless on stage and we were able mm -hmm. to look each other in the eye before, during, and after shows, and that mm -hmm. was beautiful. Yeah. Now before that, you guys went and did Audio Slave. Yeah. With Chris Cornell, rest yeah. in peace. Yes. Um, Cochise, you talked about the helicopter guitar sounds earlier. <laughs> yeah, now you yeah. did that on Cochise. Yeah. A lot of great songs from that era. Um, Show Me How to Live is such a powerful record. The video got banned from MTV. Yeah, yeah. Why did it get banned from MTV? I don't know. MTV <laughs> was like Viacom owned MTV. They, right. they banned anything. You, like you, you know, um, Chris Cornell took his shirt off and people couldn't stand it anymore. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, you talked a little bit, you touched on a little bit of Chris chemistry with the band. Mm -hmm. um, can you get more into that? For sure. Us? I was a big fan of Chris Cornell's music, um, but it was really Rick. We were hanging out at Rick Rubin's house mm -hmm. after you know Rage disbanded, and we listened to a lot, Bad Motor Finger and the Soundgarden records. And the one thing that struck me about Chris is not only that he had a tremendously t talented as a singer, as uh, but his lyrics were dark, and they were dark in like this kind of nuanced, poetic way. Like I don't know what that guy is really about. It's mm -hmm. a little spooky. So. We called up Chris. He was living in Ojai. So me and Rick went to go see him. Now, Rick Rubin doesn't leave his house for nobody, never. Right. And when he does, like, I at the time I was driving. This pre-COVID Rick Rubin. Yeah, yeah, pre-COVID Rick Rubin. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, you know, I had like my 1985 Chevrolet Astro van that I was driving around and Ooh. maintaining my punk credentials at the time. Right. And like, Rick doesn't go anywhere unless he's in a Rolls Royce that's like inside another Rolls Royce. <laughs> you know? so, you know? so he's in my van and we're driving right. up there. We're driving up there, so he must be serious about it. So, you know, we, we you know, of course, Chris lives in like the last lonely mansion on the last lonely mm -hmm. hill is it in the darkening skies you're kind of coming through the woods there and we pull in and it's getting it's shadowy and dark and, and it's just kind of like you know like old sort of spanish style house there's a bunch of motorcycles around long stairway and like, like straight up adam's family doors that right. open without like somebody opening them and here comes chris six foot two lanky of frame dark of countenance right, right. comes out those doors comes loping slowly down the steps rick turns to me and goes Let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> like our souls are in peril. <laughs> There's that word again. Fortunately, we persevered. Right. And, you know, and while I was a bandmate of Chris Cornell and a friend of Chris Cornell, I never stopped being a fan of Chris Cornell. Mm -hmm. He was a tremendous talent, a great dude. And I believe that his work in Soundgarden and, Rage and, and uh, Audio Slave will never be outshined. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, since Audio Slave, at least the songs were largely apolitical because yes. you guys did do some That's politically right. uh, charged shows, yeah, yeah. Um, particularly in Cuba, That's which right. you said was an inspiration for the Revelations album. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, just Audio Slave was the first American rock and roll band mm -hmm. to ever play a show in Cuba. Wow. Ever. We broke the rock and roll, uh, you know, like they, they were, we weren't allowed to records. do it. Do you yeah. know who the first hip hop group to play Cuba was? No. Black Star. Oh. Yeah, 1999. Awesome. What year were you guys there? Uh, 2003. Yeah, so 2003. 1999, we did the we we uh, founding groups at the Cuban Hip Hop Festival. Oh, that's which awesome. is now like a huge thing in Havana now. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Um, but yeah, it was it was apolitical, and you started the Night Watchmen by yes. all accounts yes. to indulge in yes. your more political yeah. side. Um, folk music. I call hip hop folk music because it speaks in the language that the people are speaking on the yeah. ground right it now. Is. Yeah, it is. Um, you were inspired by Billy Bragg sure. being courageous and fearless yeah. with his music. Um, Night Watchmen became your principal focus, and you said it helped you grow as a songwriter. Um, what can you share about your journey with that project? Sure, sure. I didn't start singing until my mid thirties, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it, I was at a. a it was like Thanksgiving at Covenant House, which is a teen homeless shelter in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And and there was a guy who got up on the mic and he his life was fucked up mm -hmm. and he had a lot of problems. And he got up there with a guitar that was not in tune and his voice shook and I believed every word mm -hmm. he said. And I thought to myself, there's something there mm -hmm. that I need to find in me. Mm -hmm. I love to play a big guitar solo in an arena or a stadium, but there's something, there's a truth in what's happening here that I feel is an unexplored part of my own artistry. So I began writing my own songs and I would be on tour with Audio Slave. We'd play some basketball arena on a Tuesday night and you know the night off on a Wednesday night, I'd go down to like open mic night at the coffee house, sign up as the night watchman and play those three songs with a latte machine whirring in the background and five people that weren't listening like like every soul in the room was at stake. Mm, sounds like open mic to me. Yeah, you know. But, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but I mean, then I built this catalog of like almost 100, 100 songs that right. felt to me like it was the truth, 
you know? Yeah. And so I had one foot in the world of like big rock star, you know, arena rocking and one foot in the in the world of like that. Here's the thing, like I've always been drawn to heavy music. Mm -hmm. for, first for me, it was metal, then it was punk, then it was hip hop. And then I realized that it's as heavy as it gets with three chords and the truth, mm -hmm. with the right couplet and the right couple of chords, like you can bring a room to pin drop silence and make people reconsider everything they've ever thought. And I've had that experience quite a few times in the world of playing, you know, folk music and that continues to be a part of my DNA. That's so beautiful. Um you mentioned punk earlier. You guys opened for suicidal tendencies, right? Yeah. What was yeah, it was that the like? first European tour. Yeah. I mean awesome. I mean that was they were so gracious. This we didn't have I don't think we had a record out yet. Mm -hmm. We were just a completely unknown band and Suicidal took us out in Europe to open up for them and they were, you know, they were big stars right. and whatnot and and we had never played shows in front of you know audiences of that size right. or whatever we went out there and things like we this was the time like we had like that the like the band the who quality where we would smash our gear at the end of the show it only matters if you smash your gear if you can't afford to replace it right and we couldn't afford to replace it <laughs> right. <laughs> right so you're like in the van on the way to stuttgart going i don't know what we're <laughs> gonna do <laughs> somebody's got to tape the guitar neck back on or we're not gonna be able to play bomb track tonight Air guitar right. it is. yeah 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 wow um is that jared over there yes what's up jared so i started um my career with a company called Ruckus. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ruckus actually put out an album called Lyricist Lounge, which features Zach. Of course, yeah. And Karis won, and I believe his last Emperor on yeah. it. Did a yeah. record called CIA Criminals yeah. in Action. Yeah, that. So that's was the Battle of Los Angeles was was popping at this time. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. our world, and this is around the time of the Meadowlands Mumia show. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, me and Jared came back together to do this podcast. Yeah. Um, now, a funny story I tell about a Jared that embarrasses Jared because, you know, he's the record label guy. Sure, is sure. That, Which is embarrassing to begin with. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Jared, is that, uh, Jared, Jared, we Jared love you. Alone. Yeah, we love you, Jared. Yeah. I'm, glad you, I'm glad I noticed you at the corner of my eye as soon as I'm about to go into this, because I didn't even know you were going to be here for this yes. that I'm about to say. But 9-11, terrible day for this country. Of course. Now, my name is Talib Kweli Green. That's no, how I'm born. Great. Yeah, it's not great. So, I'd lean into the green. Yeah, on well, that one. <laughs> this is what Jared and them, t this is what they tell me. <laughs> So, yeah, so don't tell this story. No, I'm telling this story. So Jared is partner, Brian, they called me in for a meeting. And we're having a meeting about how about my name. You know what I'm saying? And they're like, you didn't see the news? We need to talk branding. <laughs> <laughs> we talk branding, son. Right. <laughs> you didn't see the news? Like, what's going on? So this is something like, and me and Jared are, are good friends at this point. So I'm, he's embarrassed when I tell this story sure. because he's come around since then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, been, it's, it's, been his, it's his livelihood, too. He's got rent. Yeah, he's, he's got, got rent. rent. Um. Yeah. Now, you made a Night Watchman song, No One Left, yes. for the Fahrenheit 9-11. Yes. After the events of 9-11, Rage Against the Machine songs, all of them, yes. were banned from Clear Channel. That's correct. What was that like? That's correct. Yeah, so in the aftermath of 9-11, Clear mm -hmm. Channel, which at the time was a radio station conglomerate that controlled the airwaves of almost every genre of music in every city in the country. Mm -hmm. It was hundreds and hundreds of radio stations, and they put out a list um, of songs that... Uh, in the aftermath of 9-11 that Americans would be too s sensitive to listen to. Mm -hmm. And it was it was from the Bangles' Walk Like an Egyptian. Which is a great record. To John Lennon's <laughs> Imagine, to the Gap Band's You Dropped a Bomb on Me. This is not a world I want to live in. All, yeah, <laughs> all those songs banned from the radio. But only one artist was singled out for their entire catalog, which was Rage Against the Machine, which is in some ways a mark of pride. Um, mm -hmm. They denied... When we contacted them and said, what the fuck? Like, we, they denied they did it. And then we faxed, the, we faxed them over, like, the <laughs> list, which someone had gotten for me. Right. Uh, so they had to admit to it. But, uh, you know, the way, it, was, it was a tumultuous time. And it was a time, it was a, it was a, it was a crossroads of, like, sort of, of morality and ethics in the country. Mm -hmm. And it was a time when there could have, there were two different directions. One was to sort of recognize that this was some sort of blowback for perhaps, you know, uh, foreign policy gone astray. Mm -hmm. And the other was that this is an opportunity to make trillions of dollars for the defense industry yeah, and man. oil companies. And that's the route that we chose to go. And you see was, and when we see what's going on with Afghanistan right now, yeah, yeah. you know, obviously they had seeds long before 9-11, yeah. mm -hmm. but that was like a accelerator. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, you've toured with Bruce Springsteen. The boss. <laughs> I'll, you've toured with Bruce Springsteen. I'm going to keep doing it every time. <laughs> keep doing it. I'm ready this time, though. I, I didn't think you were going to say it while I said it, but, you know, whatever. You've been saying it. You've toured with Bruce Springsteen. The boss. And uh, he told you that you were his muse for the High Hopes album. How did you wrap Trip your- Trip on that. I mean, huh? 
I said trip on that. Right. right How that. did you wrap your head around the okay, importance first of, all, of... First of all, I am not a casual Bruce Springsteen fan. <laughs> he is the, he's someone I've never been... Well, I've been in a band with him on and off for about six years. I was never able to entirely accept Bruce Springsteen as a peer. Mm. He is the only friend of mine to whom I subscribe to a fanzine about. <laughs> <laughs> so it never really gets right. like entirely comfortable. Um, <laughs> but I, I will say this, like I, you know... I was a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. I ran into him in a studio in L.A., and he said, Tommy, and it's awesome that he calls me Tommy because right. no one else. I, as a kid, everybody called me Tommy, and then I took right. a break, and then Bruce Springsteen called me Tommy. Right. And he's like, you should come play with us sometime. And so I, you know, when they were playing in Anaheim in 2008, I hit him up. I'm like, do you remember when you said we should play together sometime? And we played the song The Ghost of Tom Joad. It was an, it's an acoustic song mm -hmm. from a, like a Woody Guthrie-like folk record of his, but Rage Against the Machine covered that That's song right. in 1997 with a bombastic, rageified yeah. version. And so then in, in 2008, he said, let's play Ghost of Tom Joad. Now, I didn't know what to play. I didn't know what we were going to do. And so I arrived there and listened to the band rehearsing it at Soundcheck, and Bruce had raised, he said, I want, he, he, you know, he's been to some Night Watchman shows, so he, he wanted me to sing it with him as well. And he, and, but he had raised the key of the song by eight steps. Now, as you can tell from my rich milk chocolate baritone voice, that I'm not, <laughs> not going to win American Idol with, any, with, with the high notes. Right. And so I'm panicking. I'm about to play with one of my idols, Bruce Springsteen, the E Street Band that I've admired for years, mm -hmm. and I can no longer sing the song. So I get on stage, and Bruce, they don't call him the boss for nothing. He feels my... See? Rising panic. <laughs> he feels my rising panic. Puts his hand on my shoulder. He's like, Tommy, we're going to do the song in this key, and it's going to be great. And I'm like, thanks, Jedi Master Yoda. I still can't <laughs> sing the fucking song. So anyway, but can I, can I relay lyrics with a social justice theme? Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. Can I play a guitar solo? I sure as hell can. So that night, half a bottle of Jameson later, I step up onto the stage, and a transcendent occurrence happens. As I'm playing this guitar solo, which goes on about 82 bars, Bruce is like, just keep going and keep going and keep going. And, you know, when we finished the song, you know, we embraced and I said, turns out that was the right key. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and we've been playing the song ever since. Man, um, he is one of my favorite performers to watch. Um, I was almost brought to tears watching this HBO thing he did um, around the time of... Um, Trayvon Martin. Yes. Mm -hmm. He was one of the only major mainstream yeah. artists to speak yeah. out yeah. about Trayvon. Yeah. And he made this beautiful song. Yeah. And um and just to see him and, and Clarence uh, Clarence Clemens was still yes. alive at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See him, you know, standing on top of the piano and all mm -hmm. the wild shit he do is just like such an inspiration yeah. as a performer. And just their their friendship mm -hmm. and their creative chemistry in a band like Bruce Springsteen's like I would talk with Clarence I'm like we're the only two black dudes in the building mm -hmm. dude. like that right, right. <laughs> you know at a Bruce Springsteen show right. but like just the the idea of their friendship and the the importance of their collaboration through the years I think has been very important in on a lot of levels that go beyond music I agree I agree um let's talk about our good friend Boots Riley sure um Boots Riley is my collaborator on the theme song for this show mm. But he still hasn't been on the show, even though he's rapping on the theme song. That and sounds about right. You talked about doing videos. <laughs> right. That sounds about right, right? That sounds about right. We, we talked about doing videos in the pandemic and learning how to do that. And I did the same thing. Like, the pandemic shut down. And the first thing I did, because you know you get creatively, you're like, I got to do something. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, yo, Boots, who I've been trying to get world famous movie director, yes, Boots Riley, yes. to do a video for the song for People's Party. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do it, Kwa. Good luck to you. And um, yeah. I was like, now is the perfect time. I was like, you got a cell phone? Like record yourself doing the song, and that's what the video is yeah, yeah, for this yeah, 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 yeah. thing. Um, oh, great, great. Street Sweeper Social Club. Yeah, uh, y'all cover "Mama Said Knock You Out." Yeah, cover "Paper Planes." Yes, also have some original material. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, how did this project come about? I was on Bruce. Uh, oh, sorry, Boots Riley mm -hmm. joined me on an acoustic tour mm -hmm. with Billy Bragg and mm -hmm. Steve Earle in two thousand and three. It was called the Tell Us the Truth Tour. Mm -hmm. um, and I suggested Boots. I was a huge fan of the coup. I'd never really met him before. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the tour felt a little too white and whatnot. So Boots came on. And every night, I was so impressed. He had to do his rhymes over just the backing with acoustic guitar, where it's right. broken down and you can't miss a syllable. I was like, this guy's a fucking genius. Like, he's a brilliant, brilliant lyricist. And 
I had like sort of a gap in my schedule at the, at the end of Audio Slave, and I was like, I called up Boots. I said, "You don't have any choice in this matter. We're in a band now. <laughs> <laughs> you do some of those words that you do so well. I'm going to put some heavy ass riffs with that, and we're just going to go out there and have ourselves a ball, which is what we did over the course of those years. And uh, you know, I can't be more happy for his success as a filmmaker. And uh, he's just a he's a great, a tremendous, eccentric." brilliant and wild artist that deserves wow. uh wild yeah, yeah. Uh, unbound. sorry to bother you unbound is a film that makes communism very appealing <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how you did Which, this well well, well if you, but in a, if you in, a Holly, it, yeah. in a hollywood film yeah, that's you know right. that's it's right. like how did you do this danny glover's in it yeah, yeah, yeah you know yeah, tessa yeah, thompson yeah. turns into an yeah, uh, incredible performance lakeith yeah. um the time that when ferguson happened rest in peace to mike brown our relationship took a new dimension yeah, because yeah. you were one of the people I called. Yeah. Um, I had gone down to Ferguson and I got really close with those people down yeah. there and activists down there and I was going to do a free concert and you came and you and I could not come on the same day. Yes. But you, even though you couldn't be there when I was there, you were like, I can come a day before. Yeah. And so I ended up organizing not one but two free concerts. That's right. The first one was you and yeah. Immortal Technique and Boots and Miles Soleil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. International. The yeah. next night was me, Bun B, uh, Common. Yes. Jessica Care Moore, Kendra yeah. Ross. Um, thank you for doing that. It was a powerful couple of nights. I mean, of course. Like that's a to me, like that's the job description. You know? Mm -hmm. I'm happy to I'm happy to rock Coachella, but that's where it's meaningful. You know, mm -hmm. we visited we, we the night of that show, a night of my show there, we visited the spot on the street where, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. he died and and then came back and played the show. And like that's what I'm in it for. That's what mm -hmm. I've all since I was 17 years old, that's what I'm in it for. Yeah. It's weird and sort of odd that there's been success or Grammys or records sold. That to me is like sort of the, it's sort of the dressing on mm -hmm. top. Like I've always been in it for that night and for standing up for, you know, trying to steal the spine of people who are trying to fight for a better world. No doubt. Atlas Underground is your most pop album. And, and so it went with the pretty reckless feels like Pop Smash and for the album you worked with EDM producers like Pretty Lights and Grammatic. With guest fe features from Killer Mike, Bass Nectar, Gary Clark Jr., Vic Mansa, Steve Aoki. What was the thinking behind this album? Yeah, the idea with the Atlas Underground Project is that I firmly believe that the electric guitar is the greatest instrument created by humankind. From mm, a, okay. from a, you know, the from a, a nuanced ballad to Metallica crushing a stadium. But I mm. also believe that the electric guitar has a future and not just a past. Mm. Right. A lot of electric guitar players are traditionalists mm -hmm. and that they're, they're mired in what has come before. I've always, I'm not one of them. I always, I'm like, what can it be in the right. future? And so connecting with younger artists, artists in different genres and finding, like having my guitar playing sort of be the North Star through a collaborative pro, like a, a creating, a, it's called the Atlas Underground because it's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy of like-minded artists of different genres forging an alloy of Marshall Stack power with hip hop, with right. EDM, with pop music, with younger artists in order to make something that hasn't been heard before, but that touches the next generation. That's one of the best explanations of anything it I've is. ever heard in my life. Just give it up for that explanation. <laughs> wow. Second class. It doesn't even matter what you're talking about. Yeah. Just the, <laughs> the, the, the structure of the explanation yeah. was like, Primo, that's primo <laughs> stuff. It honestly sounds. Have, has anyone been to space? Huh? Miami space? No one. No. To all work? right, that's your album. Your album we played at space. Oh, oh it's a club. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's oh, a club space. in Miami. It's I an all night there. club. It's open. Until... You need to give some context clues. You... Yeah. Has anyone <laughs> been to space? I mean, if you've been to space, you've known you're been to space. My name is not oh, Tyrese. You space and this is not ludicrous. Con you con I meant. Context clues is the name of my next record. By the way. Okay, okay, wait. Time out though. I think I would know. I think I would know if anybody in this room had been to actual space. <laughs> so I'm definitely not talking about actual yeah, space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, the yeah. People's Party, we have some very interesting guests. Come you on, Elon, send us up. I once did a Funny or Die sketch with Buzz Aldrin mm. and Quincy Jones and Snoop Dogg and Soldier Boy. Yeah, Buzz Aldrin, who once punched somebody in the face for asking him if he really went to space. <laughs> you know, you know who else asked him if he really went to space was Timmy C from Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> of course, of course. He ran up on him. Of he course. ran up on a barbecue. <laughs> Malibu afternoon. From the that ain't real. And he's like, Buzz <laughs> Aldrin, dude, get off me. Right. I'm, I was Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Shout out to Seth Green, by the way, who just left out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mentioned your name, and he's like, man, I love Tom Morello, man. He used to have these running charades at his house. Yeah. I was yeah. like, Tom seems like a fun guy. Yeah. <laughs> do you do Taboo too? We used to. Like, my life, I had ki- I got young kids, and that all... My He's house the one to is, tell my, house, me. my house sort of flipped. There was a period where it flipped. Where yeah. it was, there was one thing, and now it's another thing. Uh, and both those things are good. Right. Seth was sort of part of the one. The first yeah. one. I got you. He's the one that told us that you like whiskey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a constant. Taboo is a family game. Fam- yeah. <laughs> Not uh, the way we played it. Right. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> the Rage Against... Well, before I ask this question, um, I'm not really a fan of EDM. Mm-hmm. But I'm a fan of good music. Yeah. And every genre has his standouts. Of course, yeah. And Steve Aoki obviously is a standout of the yeah, genre. Sure. I mean, I've liked just about everything he's done. That record you got with him, I don't even know what the fuck that was. That's right. That's right. It, it's kind of mind-blowing. Okay, first record. of all, I'm not a fan of EDM music either. For me, that entire genre was like the shit I heard in Italian taxi cabs that drove me crazy. Right. Like, turn elevator. it off. I'd get me back to the hotel. Right. Um. And when I was I was sitting around, I was I'd made four Night Watchman records, four sort of Americana folk records. And I was sitting around in my studio with some friends, and there's an engineer dude by the name of Bull Shark. And I was like, play me something that you like that I've never heard before. Mm. And he played me a group by the name of Knife Party. Mm-hmm. And they're and it's like a sort of a dubstep group. And I and I was kind of blown away. I'm like, I guarantee you those dudes love Rage Against the Machine and Audio Slave. Like right. it had like, it was heavy. There were no guitars in it, but it was heavy and had that sort of tension and release. Wow, 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 the wow, tension yeah. and release. And so I called him up. I said, let's do a song together. And that was the beginning of the Atlas Underground project was, mm-hmm. I was like, there's a, cor- every genre has a lot of music that sucks in it. Can we yeah. all agree on that? I mean, Absolutely. I was like, Can we all agree on that? Um, but then I found the corner of the EDM world where if we're able to replace some of your electronics with my bare hands and mm-hmm. Marshall Stack, let's create an alloy that's different than people heard before. Yeah, and what's crazy is, you know, on my quality album, with that song, The Proud, is the yeah. intro was done by Eric Krasno mm. and his group Fire Department is so live. And he's in a bunch of groups and there's Lettuce and there's the Break Science guys. Yeah. And there's like this whole like sort of jam band overlap with hip hop thing. Yeah. And they're like, come out and play with this guy, Pretty Lights. And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Oh, yeah. And they're like, come out. And I did this song, Pretty Lights. And I was like, I don't know what this is. Yeah. I don't know what's going on, but sure, you, you're going to pay me to do a verse, sure. And then a couple months later, Pretty Lights is calling me like, come do Conan with me. Yeah. And I'd never done Conan as Talib Kweli, yeah. but now I'm doing it with Pretty Lights, a guy right. I never even knew yeah, existed yeah, 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 yeah. months before. Yeah. And then they're like, okay, come back to Denver and do a song with this guy, Grammatic. Yes. And I'm like, I don't know. Those are my boys. Yeah, Those and are my so, boys. <laughs> you know, Pandora and Spotify and all these things go by the algorithms of what your fans are listening right. to. Mm-hmm. It may not be what you see yourself as. That's correct. As a matter of fact, I got a Spotify playlist. You know, they do this. This is Tom Morello. Oh, yeah. And this yeah. is Talib Kweli. I have a list, a playlist called Nah. This is Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> that's great yours. Play. That's yeah. the one. Yeah, like this yeah. is what I like yeah, that yeah, I yeah. made. My algorithm. It? Yeah, my yeah. algorithm. <laughs> because a lot of my fans are kids who are hip hop adjacent, right? And who know yes, me yes. from Grammatic, yes, yes. and know yes. me from yeah, I understand that. Pretty Lights. I understand and that. And I'm like, those are not songs that I feel like represents what I do. I understand music. that. I understand that. But people love those yeah. records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so when I see your record with these names on it, yeah. I'm like, he got Pretty Lights, Grammatic, Steve Aoki. Yeah. And he got Vic Mensa, who we had on the show. Sure. Mm-hmm. Killer Mike, who needs to come on the show. Yeah. And I'm just like, yo, this is big exactly- Big Boy, too, on that record. Oh, yeah, yeah, Big Boy's boy, on it. Yeah, um, on and you didn't you do something with Fantagram as well? Yeah, Fantagram. And they, a got, a, yeah, they yeah. got a thing with Big Boy. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man, it's, it's yeah. all beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Commandante- it's a dope album. That's straight up rocking. Straight up rocking. Straight up rocking. It was an idea, like, you know, it was during during that lockdown time. It was like much of my day, I got my, I'm at home with my ni- my mom's 97 years old. Mm. My mother-in-law's 90 years old. Mm. I got two kids. They're going crazy on Zoom at school. You know, I'm, I'm running I'm running a nursing home and a daycare center and I've got two <laughs> dogs who are not a kennel. I got the whole thing. And so I would escape up to my studio. I was like, I'm also a guitar player. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> During that right. narrow window of like however, for 25 minutes a day, let me be a guitar player. Right. So the Commandante EP, I was just like, I'm going to play some guitar. So you I called up Slash and whatnot, this, that, and the other. I was just like, I'm going to make the record that like my guitar, I don't, I respect the tribe of guitar players, mm-hmm. but I don't overserve them mm-hmm. because I consider myself an artist that's not just that. I'm kind of mm-hmm. trapped being a guitar player, mm-hmm. but like I made that record for them. It was Commandante. I mean, I don't want to get too much into race because we're having such a good conversation. You but, always make everything about I know, race. That's Talib. what they say about me. 
<laughs> but I mean, that's what they say about me is a good name for a record. Yeah, that's a good name for a quality record. Yeah, I was gonna name my record. I could say it on this show because if I say it on Instagram, it sounds pretentious. But I could say it on this show because you hear, hear my tone and my voice and how loving it is. I was gonna name my next record. Quali was right. I yeah. think that I don't give a shit if that sounds pretentious. I love it. I think <laughs> absolutely that's what you're love Let it. Let people know. Let people know. I got a couple more years before I hit them with that one. Yeah. Um, I got a couple more rights to be right about absolutely first. Absolutely love yeah. it. Um, yeah, I just say I needed to see you and Slash together. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like as the like yeah. black guys in yeah. these groups. Yeah, because no one, no one, very few people who are fans of either of our bands, Guns N' Roses, like know that we're black dudes. That's very you know true. What I'm saying? Like I I, the one thing that I knew you were black, but I, I didn't, didn't know you were like born in Harlem. Pops was in the Mau Mau's black. <laughs> yeah, he's like, no, no, no. Here's the thing: that's and, and black. I, here, let me tell you this. Wait, let, me, I, let me tell you this. I've not, not not only am I black, but I'm weirdly black because I have changed colors mm. during my life and career. Mm. I grew up in Libertyville, <laughs> Illinois, mm -hmm. where I was the only black. Mm -hmm. Kids used to touch my hair. They marveled that the color of my palms was different than the color of the back of my hands. Mm -hmm. There was there was a noose in my family's garage when I was mm -hmm. 13 years old. I, that's not the only noose I saw mm -hmm. as a as a young person oh. in in the town. I was my mom, who was a white lady teaching in high school, had shit written on her blackboard that mm -hmm. was what you might expect. Mm -hmm. I was black as coal. Later on, I played in a popular rock and roll band that that had a lot of the markers of white rock and roll music. There mm -hmm. were electric guitars. The way that I speak is not typical of urban vernacular. Mm -hmm. And so then there's a lot of fans of Rage Against the Machine and Audio Slave that when I often, which I often do in Twitter and Instagram and whatnot, refer to myself, my African-American heritage, they're like, you're not black. <laughs> right. You're not no, Tom Raw is not black. Right. <laughs> in that <laughs> voice, in that exact he voice. Couldn't, he, couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't be black. He couldn't be black. He, that riff in Bob Trick, that's not written by a black guy. Right. Now, I'm glad you said that because let's take a moment to give flowers to Big Mama Thornton yes. and to all the yeah, history yeah, yeah. Of, of, of black music of and the creation of rock yeah, from, and roll. From Sister Rosetta Thorpe to, to Little Red. Like, rock and roll is created by black people. Right. I mean, that's, it's created yes, by black people. And let's talk about living color and fishbone. Sure, and, sure, sure. And, and, and but I think, the I think the Slash mm -hmm. and myself are, are kind of outliers in a mm -hmm. way that the majority of our fan bases mm -hmm. are people that are not just white people, but are also white people that don't know that we're black people. Right. You know, and that that's right. an interesting, like, and I have a different relationship to it than, than Slash does, but we have one black parent, one white parent, That's right. each of us, you know? And it's a- uh, And in America, they make you black. It's, it's hard. Black. Makes you super, like super duper black. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> like I subscribe, like no one can tell, here's the thing, like, people are like, you're not black, you know, like you talk like this and you play like that. There was not a noose in your garage when you were 13 years old. The Ku Klux Klan put a noose in my garage because I was, because of how black I was. Mm -hmm. The dad, Renee Duba's dad, didn't let me take her to homecoming because when I showed up on the doorstep, I like how you still he got saw, her name right saw, there. Like, she, loaded she, up. She, she and I, she and I have <laughs> talked this out, but like because of what I looked like when I showed right. up. What on did the he door. say? Did he say that's why? Or you no, he took her in another room. He took her away, and then she had to come back. And the, bless her heart, like, mm -hmm. poor dear, she had to go. Like I, I, I can't go. And so go. she couldn't go to her homecoming either. No, she couldn't go. Wow. But this is why you did a voodoo child over. Yeah. All right. I did voodoo child. Here's the thing. Here's the like. Here's the the curse of Jimi Hendrix. Here's the curse when you're like a black dude who plays electric guitar mm -hmm. until Living Color, who mm -hmm. does does not get near the credit they mm -hmm. deserve mm -hmm. for sort of transforming the idea of what it means to be a, a rock to, to be a black person playing rock and roll. Every single fucking gig I ever played in my entire life. Until Living Color, someone would go like, play Manic Depression, play Foxy Lady, play with your teeth. There was no room. Mm. There was no room to be a dark skinned person with an electric rock and That's roll guitar crazy. that was that. not Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. You had to be that. You, you, they, it, was, they was, it was not okay mm -hmm. with anybody if you weren't that. So was it like a catharsis to do Voodoo Child and put it out in this way? Yeah. So, then, so, so I had to, in a way, deny. Jimi Hendrix mm. growing up. I had to deny it. Because if I embraced it, like, of course he's a Jimi Hendrix fan. <laughs> of course. <laughs> right. Like, of, right. Yeah, well, it's a black, of, yeah, why not, dude? You, right. better, you better play, uh, you know, that's those songs. I wanted to play Eruption by Eddie Van Halen and uh, Mr. Crowley by, mm. you know, Rand, Randy Rhodes and, and whatnot, which I did. But then I, on this record, played, did a cover of Voodoo Child, where I was like, 
I'm fine. I've made peace with it now. Right. The waters are settled. Wow, that's ill. Um, so let's talk about Atlas Underground Fire right yes. now. Um, before we started the interview, I talked about the power and the dynamic and frenetic energy of the video, the lyric video for um, Let's Get the Party Started sure. with Bring Me the Horizon, sure. you said, from Brazil. Sure. Tell me more about sure. that. Sure. So here I am. I'm locked up during lockdown. Mm -hmm. I got grandmas I'm trying to keep alive, <laughs> kids I'm trying to keep from going mm -hmm. crazy, dogs that are like making it worse everywhere mm -hmm. around. And so that half hour, hour, 90 minutes a day, I would escape up to my studio to make these global pen pals. Mm -hmm. One of those was Bring Me the Horizon. We made a song, we made a uh, song called uh, Let's Get the Party Started. And the idea, it's most of my music, when it's solo music, has to do with political issues. Mm -hmm. In order for music, because that's what's in my heart, what connects is authenticity. Mm -hmm. And this time, I was not thinking about Guatemalan labor unions, mm -hmm. I was thinking about trying to stay sane yeah. during this crazy time. And so I'm like, I can't keep that off of my record. So I'm making this record with. Um, Bring Me the Horizon. And it's, that song's about, you know, on the, on the service, like, let's get the party started. It's a huge riff. People are going absolutely fucking nuts in the video. But it's a song about when you're confronted with a mountain of anxiety, you can either slip into depression or you can party till you're done. It's a you, song that deals with till depression. Till you're, till you're done. It's yeah, a song. And, it's, and very nuanced the way it deals with depression. I gotta it's tell like, you. Very intelligent. I gotta tell you, this whole record is not a creative endeavor. This record is an antidepressant. Wow. It the is. song. Yeah, yeah cuz you saw me watching the video for this. I'm mm -hmm. literally watching this shit like this. <laughs> what the fuck is going on? Yeah. yeah <laughs> Honestly, yeah. these the lyrics, what the fuck is this yeah, riffs like yeah, whoa. Yeah. yeah. Things but, are not okay. Right. Things are not okay. Right. And so and and to be able to express that on a record and be like uh, the video like here's the thing, one thing I learned during, during I I'm not a I have no desire to be a video director. I directed five or six videos during this time. Um don't tell the attorneys, but ripping shit from YouTube. Oh, but yeah. like, man. oh no! <laughs> um, but you know but, what it is. Yeah, but but the idea is like is like try like during an inhumane time, music can express your humanity. Yeah, and that's what it really felt like during this time. And making that video, it's sort of the once and future mosh pit. It's mm, like it's a once it, and future mosh pit. Now that's an album title, yeah. right? <laughs> it's like it's like this is what the live the, the video for uh, this the song. Uh, Let's get the party started. There's no artists. There's no stage. It's just crowds, and it's just what people when they're when they're that apex moment of what it's like to be in a live experience and to feel like like I'm all the way up. You know, it's the it's the summiting Mount Everest. It's the bullfighting. It's the it's when the beat drops experience, and that's what the from beginning to end. That's what the video is at a time where I was completely alone, <laughs> never seeing anyone, yeah. with very little hope of maybe ever playing a live show. Right. That's what the video looks like. Just like what I said that to you it was like, are we going to get back to this? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you have obviously incredible rock influences from Led Zeppelin to Black Sabbath. Of mm -hmm. course, cannot be understated. Um, ACDC, you redid an ACDC song yeah. with rock heroes. Yes. Uh, Bruce Springsteen, Eddie Vedder, yeah. Highway to Hell. I mean, this is a song that people, if aliens came down from Mars and said, well, what's rock and roll? You Put play that them, one up. Ah, we'll be good. Yeah. Exactly. You'd have a pretty good understanding. Yeah. 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 So just describe yeah. why you what's decided. That one? Yeah. yeah. So, so I was in the E Street Band mm -hmm. playing in Australia, in Perth, the home of Bon Scott, the That's singer right. of Highway to Hell, of ACDC. Mm -hmm. And I was paying my respects to his grave in the middle of the, mm -hmm. it. was 11 o'clock. I go to the Perth graveyard. And you might be surprised to hear that there's not an eternal flame burning on that graveyard. Mm -hmm. like you can't, you, in, in that grave. You can't find it. Mm -hmm. So I'm wandering around. And out of the distance comes a motorbike. And there's a fella on that motorbike, heavy set white dude, German World War II army helmet and a t-shirt which reads, I don't give a shit, but if I did, I'd give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, that guy's going to know where the ACDC <laughs> grave is. He's got he's to right. know, right. which he does. Right. So I pay my respects. I go back to the hotel. I see Bruce Springsteen in the hotel bar. I'm like, Bruce, is there a world where ACDC and the E Street Band overlap. And he's like, I have never thought about that before, mm -hmm. Tommy, mm -hmm. but I'm going to think about it now. So he goes up to his hotel room. The next couple of days, we start rehearsing Highway to Hell at sound checks. Mm -hmm. We find ourselves in a Melbourne soccer stadium, 80,000 people. Eddie Vedder happens to be there. He's on a solo tour of Australia at the time. Mm -hmm. And and I a light bulb goes off. I knock on the door, his dressing room door. I'm like, Bruce, I got an idea. 
We are in Australia, the home of ACDC, mm -hmm. the kings of Australia. The song Highway to Hell is like the unofficial national anthem of this of rock and roll liberation of this country. Right. What if, what if we open the show with Highway to Hell with Eddie Vedder? Wow. And he's like, that sounds like a pretty good idea. So we do it. And if you think you've seen a crowd go ape shit, you haven't, <laughs> unless you were there on that night. People, oh. I mean. It was a the poor necks of those people. It was it was a poor neck. It was like, it was like a it's like when you, like if when you're living all the way max. Yeah, that's what it felt like. And so as I was finishing this record, some a lot of great younger artists like Grandson and Fanagram and Chris Stapleton and Bring Me the Horizon and Proto Hype and Sama Abdul Hadi, a great Palestinian DJs on this mm -hmm. record. A lot of young artists. I was like, I want to make a record with my rock bros. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to Bruce and Eddie and I said, Remember that magical evening in right. Melbourne? Let's try to recreate that. And we did Highway to Hell, one of the greatest rock and roll songs of all time, with two of the greatest rock and roll singers of all time. That's so beautiful. And um, you know, I do a lot of shows with my DJ Spinelec. Shout out to Spinelec. I'm letting the world know now. The next time I go to Australia, I'm coming out to Highway to Hell. Oh, yes. You could do worse. As a DJ, see, <laughs> see, you see could... with hip hop, if you have a DJ, you can you can come out to literally anything. That's right. That's right. You know, I could right. I could walk out to, you know, any I you know, if I go to Texas, I'm walking out to UGK. Why not? You know what I'm saying? Like exactly. you can just walk out exactly. to anything. Exactly. Um, thank you for your time. I just have one more question for me personally. I think Jasmine has another question, but I want you to explain to Jasmine as someone who is <laughs> The guitar boss in the third installment of Guitar mm. Hero. Mm. I want you to explain to Jasmine why playing guitar and Guitar Hero is not the same. Yes, it is. As yes, it is. Guitar. Yes, it is. Because Jasmine. we've had a couple of people play guitar on this show. Jasmine, I am a rocker. Respectfully, and she, 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 I am a she rock said some disrespectful and roller. Things. Jasmine, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I learned the greatest. I learned the greatest rock songs okay. from Guitar first Hero all, and Guitar. All, gonna, I mean, my, from, the first thing I have to say, and you're going to like this, is. Thank you. And, and I appreciate band. the fact that Guitar Hero uh -huh. has introduced p globally mm -hmm. people who have no interest in the band Kansas or whatever, mm -hmm. right. or Joan Jett or whatever, right. to these songs, like sort of like eternal songs. Um, it's a video game. Okay, <laughs> it's a video game. And I want it, but, but, but it is a video game that has had a great influence mm -hmm. on steering people towards the idea of playing the guitar. <laughs> do you know how That's fast a very a Do you know word. how fast your well, this wait. Is with a Harvard education. Do you know how fast your fingers have to move on expert level? And I challenge he's anybody the guitar boss. I challenge anybody the, in this room. He's the boss. Listen. Hey, don't you have to go you I, I, I never played this game so on you guitar have, I have a lot I'll more to say keep about up. it, Jasmine. I'm, I'm not done. Okay. So 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 yes, your fingers have to move move fast on the dots. The, like the yellow and the blue and the red and the green dot, and that's fine. I had the game Guitar Hero at my home. Let me be crystal clear. On a scale of one to ten, I'm zero in playing Guitar Hero. It's because it's a video game, and people are great at it, and it's fun, and I want you to enjoy it, and it exposes you to a world of music that you might not have. But, so, so I had that at my home just so that children could come over and I was a digital avatar in the game, as you might remember, mm -hmm. so that children could come to my home and defeat me in real life <laughs> as me as a video avatar in my house on that game that I kind of got paid shit for. I think Slash made all the money on that game. <laughs> you know what I... I <laughs> yeah, it's a man. video game. Dudes come up to me all the time. Like in the, I was in the, the, the last... Prior to coming here, I was at another interview. He was like... I kicked your ass at Guitar Hero, bro. I'm like, I was a, it's I was, a fucking video game and you're a grown man. <laughs> <laughs> Find some interests. Like, Listen. meet a girl. I mean, I don't know. Like, get a pro an art project. <laughs> Start, do a startup. So I'm at, I'm, at the, I'm at the Ralph's or whatever mm -hmm. during the height of this. Now, there was a time. Uh, here's the thing. Like, I, my manager called me up, whatever year that game was, and says, hey, Guitar Hero. I'm like, I don't I, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. He's like, he's like, reconsider my kid plays that game and it's an afternoon i'm like okay whatever so i go in i'm in a full like green screen i'm in a like a lime green <laughs> bodysuit with a bunch of like white balls on it uh -huh. like doing my doing my shtick and, my, and i forget about it at the time it was the highest selling video game in history guitar hero 3 the one with me and slash right mm. Like I said, I think Slash made a better deal. Than that. It was fine. It was fine. So anyway, but it, ch it, it changed my life walking around because I had been, you know, I'm recognized 
occasionally for my political work, for my guitar work. Mm-hmm. I coming out of Ralph's and a mom comes like, are you Tom Morello? <laughs> and I'm like, a mom. I'm, like, I'm like, yeah. And she's like, oh, my five-year-old loves you on guitar. I'm like, right. Tell, he beat you on guitar. Tell, tell, tell me something I don't know. She's like, she's like, do they make a stuffed animal of you? Oh my <gasps> God. I want a Tom and Morello like, stuffed animal. I hadn't thought of that. But maybe that like makes me get me closer to slash on the anyway. That's interesting. That's where her mind went. Though. Yeah, yeah. She's like, she wants to It like, was for her, not she for her. She wants to serve her kid. You know what? Wow. Uh, you know what? Guitar hero players are the same as Dance Dance Revolution. Real dancers cannot do that game in real correct. guitar heroes. You were correct in your But assessment. I do have an acoustic guitar and an electric guitar, and I will learn how to play one of these days. There's nothing wrong with it. I want you to enjoy your Guitar Hero experience. There's nothing wrong with it. Don't think you're playing guitar. I'm playing guitar. <laughs> <laughs> it's my mind, and I can do what I want. <laughs> it, is your, it is your mind. You know what? I take that back. It is your mind. You are rocking the guitar, and I want yeah. you to enjoy yourself. She Thank identifies you. as a guitar player. I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I am a a trans guitar player. Oh my That's God. what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just so you know, I can't play that. Like I am, I can play the electric guitar. I can't play that game at all. And so these kids, I'm like, I, I someone should have videotaped it. Kid after kid after kid, like would come over to the house, and I'm standing there losing <laughs> to me. I'm it's real me losing to Avatar me, played by a kid I hardly know. <laughs> One after another. That is hilarious. Okay, this is amazing. It Finally, was. it really was. Thank you, Tom. Anyway, well, thanks very much for having me. It's a nice. Thank time. you for yeah. thank 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 you for trying to diminish my dreams. But, uh, <laughs> like other your dreams than that, are your dreams. <laughs> like, like if those are your dreams, oh, let's reconsider. Wake let's up. Reconsider. Uh, what is next for Tom Morello? What are you working? What is on? next is uh, you know I recorded a considerable amount of music during lockdown and mm-hmm. the Atlas Underground Fire. There's there may be fire is one of the elements. That's ah. all. That's all I'll say. Ah. That's all I'll say. Comic but, book writer yeah. Tom Morello brings his comic book sensibilities yeah, yeah, but, to his uh, music but, career. But uh, uh, what I'm looking forward to really most is I'm hopeful that in 2022 that live show. I mean, a lot of my friends are out on tour right now, and they're they're varying reviews from it's great to it's scary, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, as we rebook the Rage Against the Machine uh, tour of 2020 for 2022, and I can't wait for. I'm ho- very hopeful that it's safe and it's okay to be able to rock the world with Rage Against Machine in 2022. No right. doubt. Shout out to Run the Jewels, Killer Mike. Run the Jewels, LP. Rage Against Machine across the United States is what we need. This is the show I'm trying to be at. Yeah. No doubt. Ladies and gentlemen, the guitar boss, rock and roll legend, Tom Morello. Yeah. <laughs>